Hello and welcome to IGCSE Success. And if you're new here, a big hello to you. I'm an English teacher and I post content here on YouTube to prepare students for their Cambridge First Language English exam. And if that sounds interesting to you, be sure to check out my other videos where I break down a number of the core skills needed to succeed with First Language English. So in today's video, and yes, it might be a long one, but you guys have requested it, I will be looking at narrative writing. So this video will be particularly helpful if you are doing the coursework component, but also helpful if you are doing paper two in which you have the option to write a narrative. I'll start by giving you my top five tips to writing a successful narrative, and then we'll move swiftly on to looking at the mark scheme. And I'll end this video by looking at a successful narrative, which one of my students, completed as part of their coursework portfolio and this scored 23 out of 25. So let's get straight to it. So guys, let's just dive straight into my top five tips and these will consist of some do's and some major don'ts. So tip number one is write from personal experience. Now I always say to my students, take the ordinary and make it interesting. And it doesn't matter if you are writing a narrative for your coursework or doing it to prepare for paper two. You want to write a story that is credible. And every single year, Cambridge say the same thing. Their advice is for students to write from experience. Narratives which center around zombies, witches, the supernatural, the end of the world. Whilst some of these can be successful, from my experience, most of them end up verging on the ridiculous. And whilst it's not our intention to, I guess, curb your enthusiasm or creativity for that matter, you simply don't have the time or word count to make these type of stories successful. So yes, my first tip is to write a narrative which is believable. Something as simple as taking your younger brother shopping and then him going missing for a short period of time would be far more successful than writing about a haunted house. Now my second tip is to make sure you plan and structure your story well. Of course your narrative needs some direction, it needs a clear beginning, middle and end. And of course a good old fashioned story mountain helps here and I will try and put that somewhere here. The beginning of your narrative needs to set the scene. Your exposition could be for describing the setting for example. And of course you need to think carefully about those sequence of events which are going to lead to that climatic moment within your story. And don't forget that your ending is just as important as your beginning. You don't want your story to simply fizzle out. Unexpected yet realistic endings are often the most successful. Now my third tip is to know the features of narrative writing, be confident with using them and make sure you include them in your story. You want to make sure you include aspects of characterization, setting, tension for example. You don't want to include too many characters two, three is absolutely fine. And you want to try and make those characters as believable and compelling as possible. I would advise you to use a little bit of dialogue, but use it sparingly. You want to show Cambridge that you can use dialogue to bring your characters to life, but you want to make sure that you punctuate it accurately. Lastly, an easy way to really bring your narrative to life is to really describe the different settings within your story imagery, sensory descriptions, etc., are really going to help you achieve this and engage the reader. Now, tip number four is accuracy. Accuracy, you guessed it, accuracy. Let's not forget, guys, there are 15 marks given to style and accuracy. That's five more marks than the actual composition of your narrative. And not to scare you or anything, but Cambridge do tend to penalise quite heavily for students who make frequent errors in basic punctuation and grammar. You want to avoid any lapses in tense, comma splice errors, spelling mistakes, and really, if you are doing this narrative for your coursework, you have plenty of time to proofread it and make your writing as accurate as possible. And my last tip, tip number five, is to aim to use 
ambitious vocabulary and vary your sentence structures for effect. Of course you want to make sure that your vocabulary choices are appropriate and you want to avoid using overly colourful language which ends up being a little too much and in some cases making little sense. And if you choose to write a first person narrative you want to avoid using that first person pronoun I throughout your narrative. So you could start some of your sentences with an adverb such as anxiously she made her way towards her hometown. Or you could use an ing sentence starter such as feeling a sense of guilt they knew it was time to confess. Or how about starting with an adjective such as horrified she bolted out the door. Now of course the key thing here is just striking the right balance. So those are my five top tips. Now let's take a look at the official Cambridge Mark Scheme. Hi guys, so what you are looking at now is the syllabus for the first language English paper, which is the 0500 series. And I do strongly recommend if, well, if you are starting your first language studies to have a look at this syllabus and make sure you know how the course is put together and the kind of things that you will be doing throughout the course. Of course, if you are watching this and you are, I guess, in year 11, there's no doubt that you have seen this already and you know exactly what the expectations are in terms of the course outline and indeed the coursework. However, if you've never seen this document before, I will link it in the description box below. It is easily accessible via the Cambridge website. Just make sure you are looking at the correct syllabus and that is the 2020 syllabus. Okay guys, so what you are looking at now is the level descriptions for both assignment two and assignment three. Assignment two is the descriptive piece of coursework and assignment three is the narrative piece of coursework. However, you get 10 marks for the, the content and the structure or the composition. Okay, so they call them levels now. I think they used to be bands, but let's just, well, I'm going to assume you want to get as many marks as possible. So let's focus on level six and what we need to do to get nine or 10 marks out of 10, okay? So you'll notice there's some sort of general guidance in terms of what your narrative needs to show. And that is that the content is complex, engaging and effective, and that the structure is secure, well balanced and carefully managed for deliberate effect. And on the left, you've got some specific things that you need to include for your descriptive piece. And on the right, for your narrative. So let's just have a read of what you need to include or show to get those top marks. The plot is well defined and strongly developed with features of fiction writing such as description, characterization and effective climax and convincing details. So in other words, guys, is your narrative well organized? Does it have a clear sense of direction? Is there, I guess, a clear beginning, middle and end? Does your narrative include aspects of fiction writing? All things I mentioned before, really. Have you described your setting, your characters? Have you created these believable and interesting characters? Is there a climax? Does something happen? And are the details you have included, your story, your character setting, etc., convincing? Are they believable or are they completely ridiculous and far fetched? In terms of content being complex, you might want to consider different ways to structure your story for effect or using certain structural features for effect. Okay, you could, and it's perfectly okay to do this kind of chronological story, a clear beginning, middle or end. Could you perhaps start halfway through? Could you use flashbacks? Could you use um, foreshadowing, for examples? These are quite complex skills that Cambridge will certainly reward well if they are done right. 
Now, what you're looking at now is the level descriptions for style and accuracy. Remember, there are 15 marks up for grabs for your style and accuracy. That is five more marks than the actual composition of your narrative. So let's take a look at what we need to do to get level six or 13 to 15 marks out of 15. So precise, well-chosen vocabulary and varied sentence structures chosen for effect. Consistent, well-chosen register suitable for the context and spelling, punctuation and grammar almost always accurate. So you want to make sure that, as I've mentioned previously, that you use some examples of ambitious vocabulary, but you also want to make sure that those words are well chosen or suitable for your given context, okay? We don't want any sort of overly colorful language, which kind of, you know, makes little sense. Vary your sentence structures, so don't repeat that I voice throughout the, the entirety of your narrative. Use a style, a sustained style throughout your narrative. So it could be um, a first person narrative, third person, some sort of dramatic monologue. That's absolutely fine. And spelling, punctuation and grammar, almost always accurate. Um, one or two misplaced commas, I guess, would be okay. But your spelling, punctuation and grammar, it needs to be top notch, really, if you are certainly aiming for an A or an A star. So for the last part of this video, we are going to be reading a piece of coursework that one of my students produced. And whilst it's not mechanically perfect, it uses features of narrative writing particularly well. So let's take a read. Okay guys, so now I'm going to read the coursework that one of my students produced. And as mentioned, I think it got, it either got 23 or 24 out of 25. And this particular student received uh, an A star for her coursework portfolio. Let's take a read and I will be stopping and starting to discuss what is particularly effective about the way she's written her story. Okay, so she has titled her story, The End. He rolls onto the left side of his body. Mild, discomforting, throbbing occupies his chest. Hopeful, the pain will fade. He forces both eyelids shut. So this particular student has decided to write in present tense. It really has that dramatic impact. It's like we are there in the moment. We've got some lovely vocabulary choices, discomforting throbbing. And of course, we've got some lovely uh, effective sentence structures as well. Let's continue. A sudden jolt abruptly wakes him. It feels as if a 12,000 pound elephant hammers down, closing in on his chest. As the giant mammoth paces back and forth, his body deliberately responses by gasping air through violent coughs. He pushes his full weight as he rolls hastily off the memory foam mattress, grasping for a cool glass of water with his grotesquely bluish hands to wash down the pain. Stumbling into the living, he's finally allowed only a single breath of relief. Gosh, again, um, the imagery, the characterization, there's this real palpable sense of pain through how the student has described their character's situation. Glass shatters on the freshly shined Italian marble tile. Pitch black darkness minimizes his sight to only shadows, enabling him from finding his cell. The added feeling of nausea overwhelms his senses. A sharp fragment pierces the skin beneath his staggering legs as increasing tightness rapidly shuts on his searing chest. In haste, he recalls the previous occurrence of a vividly familiar encounter. Right hand clenches his chest as his left attempts to stabilise his weight by lying flat on the chilly stone counter. Ah, oh, darling, help. I think I'm going to have another attack. He breathlessly wails as a sharp pain forces his fragile frame to slam onto the polished oak. 
So again, structure is really controlled here. There's a clear sense of direction. The characterization is done incredibly well. And the tension as well. As a reader, we are just instantly engaged. We want to find out what is the matter. Let's continue. Alone, she ponders in the waiting room, staring blankly into the beige walls. She twists the ring which wraps her fourth finger reminiscing the promise it holds to spend eternity with him. A thousand thoughts swamp her head with distractions, but only one of real significance. Although she was hopeful, although she was hopeful not allow the most important thought to enter, a little bit of an error there, she thought to herself how ridiculous some of her passing concerns were, irrelevant and selfish at the least. Like who will light the fire with the arrival on winter next month? Or will she fix the half loose hinge of the door to the pantry? After what seems to be decades of solitary patience, a slender man in a white lab coat approaches her. Mrs. Collins, I have an update on your husband's condition. If you will follow me, please. The man vaguely gestures, mimicking routine. Sentence construction is slightly off there. She cringes at the thought of her second half's fate that sits in a stranger's left hand, and that's a little bit awkward as well. The physician gestures down the plain corridor that is too brightly lit by cold white light, so some lovely description there. The silence screams a high-pitched chill through her spine. He twists the knob of his office door and gestures for her to take a seat on the worn-out sofa opposing the fabricated armchair. Like clockwork, he shut the door to deliver his findings written in one of the many ordinary reports his file contained. Beep, 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 beep. Inconsistent heart rate, not a good sign. He stirs from his slumber only to find an imminent nightmare he has woken into. Attempting to shift even his legs seem impossible, let alone sitting upright. To his left, a catheter connected to a waste bag is half filled with yellow waste, while his already discoloured hand is pierced to replace fluids lost. A familiar, a familiar shadow appears in the corner of the suite by the minibar. Hey, you're up! She swallows her tears, mustering the strength to stall a breakdown. His eyes attempt to focus on the growing shadow. Hey, are you feeling? How are you feeling, dear? She gently sets the plastic cup with a straw on the tray table and caresses his bluish-purple hand. He grunts, pursuing to communicate. It, it hurts, he croaks. What hurts? Everything. She swiftly grabs hold of the cup of water and directs the straw towards his mouth. The characterization, the dialogue here is just brilliant. It's realistic and it really brings the characters to life we can really we can really understand their situation and the pain both characters are going through here drink some water he coughs and attempts speaking what happened where am i you're in the hospital dear you suffered another heart attack and a stroke this morning now what i will say is you've probably noticed the dialogue has not necessarily been punctuated or set out the way it should be set out as you know when there is a new speaker it should be put onto a new line plus when you put it all together it makes it far more difficult to follow so i was quite surprised in many ways that this particular student got as many marks as what they did um because i would be inclined to take a few more marks away as a result of the dialogue you suffered another heart attack and a stroke this morning. A brief silence fills the room with the sound of beeping machines. I spoke to your doctors earlier. Apparently, the recurring chest pains you've had the past couple of weeks were minor attacks. She strives to avoid the unbearable emotions the fresh information carries with. So, it is serious this time. He questions her, although he already bore the answer weeks ago. Although the thoughts overwhelm them, they remain frozen. She harshly denies the unbearable life that lies ahead after him, as he denies denies the idea of leaving her alone to care for herself. She regretfully informs him the information from the doctor, bearing the half-truth for the first time. 
The doctors say that your condition is too severe and at this age, surgery is too risky. She wipes her tears, taking a pause. Gosh, guys, this is too much and it's late. <laughs> your organs are slowly shutting down one by one, but they will do everything they can to make you feel as comfortable as possible. She then plasters on a little smile, telling him not to worry about her. Their daughters are flying back tonight and they will take care of her when he's gone. Just really beautifully written, really, really emotive. The characters, the situation, it's believable, guys. Let's read the last bit of the story. She assesses his foreign state as he endeavours to take in the beautiful view of, of his better half, even though she appears only as a shadow. They remain in comfortable silence, embracing what precious time remained for them after sharing more than half their lives with each other. How lovely. She strokes his hand, grasping memories that seem as if they were created only yesterday. His attempt to humour her for attention in a little corner cafe a block away from her apartment, the ceremony where they sealed their vows with a new shiny ring, the first place they called home, news of expecting a baby girl, news of a second baby girl on the way, wave, waving them off to preschool, finding his first grey hair and then hers, attending the girls' graduations and weddings, the celebration of their blessings on a three-month cruise, holding their grandsons and newest granddaughter only three months ago. The memories linger as they both block out the harsh reality. That list, I think, used really effectively there. And the last paragraph. She sobs in silence, afraid to ruin the final moments they'll share. Hey, stop crying, sweetheart. I'm here. I'm right here. Move closer to me. His voice husks with a smile of comfort. She reaches to flick the light switch and climbs into bed, embracing her fading haven. I love you. She places a lingering kiss on his forehead. Just before she falls into tranquility, she catches a reply that will leave a mark in her memories. I love you too, her beloved hummed for the final time. Together, they drifted off to Utopia, only for her to awaken in solitary on the other side. Gosh, guys, it's been quite a long time since I've read this piece of coursework. It, as I said, it was sent off to Cambridge, but gosh, what an emotional story. And hopefully you can see, I did say it's not grammatically and mechanically perfect, but the structure, the characters, the setting, the tension, the story, just everything coming together creates this really compelling narrative. And that's why I believe this scored a very high mark indeed. That's all from me today, guys. If you have found this video helpful and you would like me to do a similar video for descriptive writing, do let me know in the comments below. Again, please do like and subscribe and thank you for your continued support and I will see you again very soon. Until next time, bye-bye.